Hello and welcome to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast, where each week, Pastor Jeff Cranston explores biblical theology that provides practical life applications in an understandable way. Thanks for joining us at the table. Let's get started. Hello, welcome to Kitchen Table Theology. I'm your host, Tiffany Coker, along with my dad, Pastor Jeff Cranston. We have been working our way through a Bible overview series, and guess what? We are halfway through. Beginning with episode number 143, we have now discussed and studied 33 of the Old and New Testament books with their theological themes. So if you've missed any of those, we encourage you to go back, give them a listen. But before we dive into our 34th book today, I want to share a review with you all from Sarah. This is what she says. What a helpful resource. I love this podcast. Sometimes explaining what I believe can be hard for me to articulate or put into words, but this is so easy to understand. As a mom, I receive lots of questions. I want to continue to be a student of God's word and remind myself of these foundational concepts for myself as well as my family. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing that review. We are glad to partner with you. And I totally agree. As a mom, we get asked lots of questions. And Kitchen Table Theology really is such a helpful resource. So thank you so much for that, Sarah. We appreciate that. All right, Dad, let's go ahead and get started today. What do you have for us? Well, I want to say thank you also to Sarah. That was very kind of you. We appreciate you listening. And we're very glad we're able to help as as we can. And we always want to be a resource for everyone who listens to Kitchen Table Theology. So it's always nice to hear some encouraging words. So Sarah, thank you for that. Okay, well, let's begin today by asking, Tiff, I'll ask you, and Kitchen Table Theologian, I'll ask you, who's the most famous person you've never heard of? That's kind of a dumb <laughs> question, but does that make any sense? Who's the most famous person you've never heard of? In, in other words, there are people who have changed the lives of thousands, perhaps even millions sometimes, and most of us have never heard them. So, Tiff, can you think of anybody who might fit the bill? Not that you would know a name, but somebody that might fit that category. I definitely don't know the name, so this will prove your point, a famous person I've never heard of. But when you ask the question, somebody who has changed the lives of thousands of people, what about the person who invented the seatbelt? We Everybody wears a seatbelt every day we get in the car. I feel like surely that has saved thousands of lives. So that person probably yeah. fits into that category, but I have no idea who that would be. Yeah, every, every carpool mom who's ever said, is everyone buckled up? Buckled. Uh, yeah, owes, owes a lot to whoever that person is. I'm sure like you, they've saved countless lives, but not a name. Probably unless you work in the automotive industry, but not a name probably any of us would be able to recall. But that is nothing that a quick Google search won't solve to find out who that was. I'll give you another one. James Harrison. Ever heard of James Harrison? They estimate he has saved the lives of over 2 million people. So how has James done that? James's blood produces a rare antibody which cures an otherwise fatal disease called rhesus disease in unborn children. James has donated his blood 1,173 times, which makes him the Guinness World Record holder in donating blood, by the way. It's earned him the nickname, the man with the golden arm, I guess because they poke his arm so often. And it's it's estimated that James's blood donations have saved the lives of almost 2.4 million babies. That's pretty cool. That is really incredible. All right. Thanks to Google. A quick Google search here. The seatbelt, the man who invented the seatbelt was a Swedish man named Nils Bolin. He invented it while working for Volvo in 1958. So there we go. Someone famous that we did not know. It's estimated millions of lives have been saved because people were wearing their seatbelts. Well, that's okay. Now we Learned know what you were doing today. while I was while I was talking. One more, and I, I think you'll like this one, Kitchen Table Theologian. I love this. Maybe this will be new to some of us, but perhaps many of you have heard of this person. Have you ever heard of Edward Kimball? Edward Kimball. Well, he was a, well, that, that's for good reason. He was a Sunday school teacher at Mount Vernon Congregational Church in Boston on Beacon Hill in Massachusetts. Tiff, our families, we were up in Beacon Hill in Boston, not too many years, years ago, ago to watch mm-hmm. 
watched Clemson beat Boston College on a I, I, I literally Frigid. have never been colder. <laughs> I've never been colder in my life. It was, it was brutal. Anyway, at that church, Edward Kimball met a young boy who was only coming to church because he was working in his uncle's shoe store. And his uncle said, if you're going to work for me, you have to go to church. So he was, he was going to church. He was very resistant, resistant to the gospel. Mr. Kimball was teaching him, and he said, we had some very interesting and very frustrating conversations, but Mr. Kimball didn't give up. He went so far as to even visit this young man at the shoe store from time to time. So he was developing a relationship with this guy, and eventually the Holy Spirit did what the Holy Spirit does, and the young man was converted to Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit to bring him to salvation. That young man's name, and a lot of you probably know, was Dwight. Lyman Moody, D.L. Moody, the founder of Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, and a man who preached the gospel to, and I, I could not believe this when I read it, but according to the D.L. Moody Center, Moody preached to approximately 100 million people. And it's all the more astounding because this was during the late 1800s. Well, Edward Kimball, let's go back to Edward for a second. He was faithful to share the gospel. Now, Track this. Here's the interesting part of the story. Among those millions that D.L. Moody shared the gospel with was a man who eventually became a pastor in London by the name of Frederick Brotherton Meyer, F.B. Meyer. Now, I've I've got F.B. Meyer's books on my shelves. My favorite author, F.W. Borum, when he was a young man working in London, would go to F.B. Meyer's Saturday afternoon Bible class for young men. Meyer would share the good news with a man who eventually became a Presbyterian evangelist named John Wilbur Chapman. Chapman played a major role in the life of another prominent evangelist, kitchen table theologian. You may have heard of this baseball player turned evangelist named Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday then played a major part in the faith walk of a guy named Mordecai Ham, who began broadcasting on radio in the 1930s. He was an evangelist as well. He was preaching at an old-fashioned tent revival in North Carolina on November the 1st, 1934, and he helped lead yet another young man to faith. His name was William Franklin Graham, Jr. And Billy Graham, as you may know, was one of the most influential men of the 20th century. So Billy Graham owes his salvation to the faithful witness of a Sunday school teacher in the mid-1800s by the name of Edward Kimball, a guy almost all of us have probably never even heard of. Is it, and, and plus, so does Billy Sunday and Chapman and Meyer and, and Ham. It's, it, it's an incredible story. That is an awesome timeline, be able to track down through all those people. All right, Dad, what does all of that have to do with today's podcast? That was a long intro. Tell us why we're going through all the famous people we've never heard of. Yeah, well, that was a great question. I never thought You'd ask. I was wondering how long you were going to let me keep talking there. But we have before us today someone whose name we may have heard, but for some of us, his name may not be familiar. If you're familiar with the New Testament, you will have heard of this in this guy's name. His name is Titus. Paul wrote him a letter. That's the book for today. But beyond his name, kitchen table theologian, I wonder what do you know about that man named Titus? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit. It it did take us just a minute to get to the meat of this or, podcast. Or five, yeah. <laughs> but we'll go ahead and dive in. So we're continuing in our Bible overview series. We're talking about Paul's letter to Titus. This is the 17th book in the New Testament. And Dad, I think we could probably say it's pretty obvious who wrote this letter, right? You maybe just said that. Yeah, it is. Paul. Paul introduces himself as the writer of the epistle to Titus referring to himself as, quote, an apostle of Jesus Christ and a bondservant of God, end quote. And as in most of Paul's letters, there are those who, there are, are always people who always dispute the authorship of every book of the Bible because they're seeking to weaken the Bible's authority and so forth. But the vast majority of biblical scholars attribute this letter to the apostle Paul. It's, it's really not anything worth an argument about. Is Paul. Perfect. Where are we in Paul's life? Because I know several of our letters, we've been from different time periods in Paul's life. Tell us where we are in Paul's life and the chrono. Oh boy. Chrono. She can't say it. You know what? I'm going to start writing in every notes I send you now is going to be the word chronology, chronological. 
I was going Correct. for chronological, but I knew that wasn't right. Chronology of the New Testament church. Where are we in that timeline also? How does Titus fit into all of that? That reminds me, Jen, when we were doing the podcast together, <laughs> always tripped over the word omnipotent. <laughs> yeah. And so I tried to write it in our as notes often as, as often as I could have. And whenever I did, she always worked around it. <laughs> so you may see the word chronology or chronological in your future. So yeah, where, where does this fit into Paul's ministry and the, and the New Testament church? Well, after being freed from his first Roman jail sentence, Paul composed his epistle, which, which is really just a letter to Titus. And he wrote it from the city of Nicopolis in AD 63. Nicopolis was a city in Greece that the Romans had claimed after naval battle, battle about 80 or 90 years before Paul came along. So Paul, Paul took Titus to the island of Crete, and I'm sure some of our listeners have, have been to Crete, after he sent Timothy to serve as the pastor preacher in Ephesus. So Titus was to serve as the leader and organizer of the island's churches during their formative years. Even though the gospel had probably already reached Crete prior to Peter's preaching at Pentecost, Paul and Titus it's mo most likely conducted a significant amount of evangelization there in the weeks leading up to Paul appointing Titus to a position of leadership. And we, we also believe Paul is the one who founded the Christian church at Nicopolis, where he was writing from. So that's, that's where he was. That's where we are in the uh, grand scheme of the New Testament church. It sounds like for someone that most of us really know very little about, we would probably recognize his name, but not know a lot more about him, that Titus really was an important part of Paul's ministry team. So tell us a little bit, what do we know about Titus? Yeah, there's more about Titus in the Bible than you might think. I, I went to an, a website I often turn to, very helpful. It's called gotquestions.org. And they had a wonderful little brief article on Titus. So let me just give you some bullet points of what they share with us. He was an early church leader, a very uh, trusted companion of Paul, very faithful servant. He was a Gentile, which I think that gives you like, oh, wow, okay. Mm -hmm. he, he was a Gentile. There weren't a lot of those leading the churches, but now we see that beginning to happen. The Jews and Gentiles together are leading the ministry. He was led in faith to Christ by Paul. That, that would be a pretty cool thing. And, and then became a co-worker accompanying Paul and Barnabas from Antioch to Jerusalem. Later, Titus went to serve the church at Corinth and really had an effective ministry there. And if you know anything about First and Second Corinthians, that, that church was a mess in many ways. Titus joined Paul in Philippi. And while he was there, he gave him a good report of the church in Corinth. And when Titus returned to Corinth, he hand-delivered. Now, this is cool. Titus hand-delivered the epistle of 2 Corinthians back to the Corinthian church. So without Titus being very careful and making a safe journey, we, we would never have the letter of 2 Corinthians. He organized a collection for the needy saints in Jerusalem. If you remember in 2 Corinthians, I, I think it's chapter 8, Paul talks about that. And the Corinthians, he was calling on them to be generous to those who were really hurting financially in Jerusalem. No, there's so much more, but let, let's just say, let me just jump to the end. The last mention of Titus in the Bible indicates that he was with Paul during Paul's final Roman imprisonment there in Rome. And from Rome, Titus was sent by Paul to evangelize the region called Dalmatia, an area which later became known as Yugoslavia and is now called Serbia, Serbia and Montenegro. And I'm sure some of our Kitchen Table Theology family have been there. He was very trustworthy, very dependable. Think about it. Paul, Paul had him lead the churches at one time or another in Corinth, Crete, and Dalmatia. Paul calls him in 2 Corinthians, my partner and fellow worker. Scripture says he had a God-given love for the Corinthian believers. And we read in 2 Corinthians that upon his return to Corinth for the second time, Titus went with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. So he was, for a guy we don't hear or know hear much about or know much about, he was really an influential leader in the early church. You could say there's a lot more to Titus than meets the eye, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. 
we I feel like we could probably spend a whole podcast on just Titus, but since our time's drawing to a close here, how about giving us a few of the theological themes that we can find in this letter? Sure. So let me quickly share three. The first is good works, good works. And it's three chapters. The letter to Titus mentions good works seven times. Paul says opponents are unfit of any good work, of opponents to the gospel and to Titus. Titus, he says, you're to be a model of good works. Paul wrote that the community Jesus forms is zealous for good works, that we are as believers to be good citizens, living with gentleness and courtesy, and ready for every good work. Paul tells us God offered salvation solely according to God's mercy and not because of any works of righteousness on our own. Titus, he's told him, you're to insist on certain behaviors related to household structure. And Paul said this, so that those who have come to believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. And then he ends the book by saying that Christians should devote themselves to good works in order to meet urgent needs. So our faith, our Christian faith, places good deeds, good works at the core of our values. Now, I want to be clear here, so kitchen table theologian, lean in a little bit. Our faith places our our theology, our faith, our doctrine, places good deeds at the core of our values, while at the same time we believe that salvation is a gift from God alone. It's Our salvation has nothing to do with our good works. But once we are saved, once we are in Christ, one of our core values is good works. So when non-Christians witness our love, our charity, our kindness, they hopefully will be more likely to have positive opinions about the Christian faith. And furthermore, when there are pressing needs, we can show our neighbors we care by offering assistance as they are needed. Okay, good works, clearly a very key theme in this book. You listed all those times that it is mentioned in such a short book. What else is there in this book, a theological theme? Well, it might sound silly to say this, but it's Jesus. <laughs> it's the person of Jesus <laughs> Christ. Now, he he's the major theme in every Bible book, but Titus in particular expresses a strong affirmation of Christ's preexistence and his incarnation. In Titus, Paul declares Christ's humanity, his death is acknowledged, and so there is a there's very much of a focus on who Christ is and what he has done. That's the second theme. The third and final theme is we're told as Christians how to live in this world. The letter to Titus, like the one to, that we call First Timothy, views the world as a place where, okay, as Christians, we live here, but we're not to be at home here. And while we are here, there are certain things God expects of us. A few of those things are brought out by Paul in his letter to Titus. For example, this letter emphasizes treating everyone with, with respect, not just Christians. And there's a continual emphasis of uh, exhibiting that we're to exhibit compassion for those who are in need. However, it's evident from this letter that even more is on the horizon. This world is not all there is. We're told by Paul to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives while we wait. So kitchen table theologian, you're called today. Our call as believers, we're to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives while we wait for the coming of Jesus Christ. So between God's grace appearing in Christ, we read about that, God's grace appeared in Christ, and a stronger connection with Christ to come, hope keeps the believer going. And Paul makes it up a strong point that, that we are to understand that and to live that out. I like that while we wait. Oh, so we may not have really known much about Titus when we started this episode today, but clearly we have learned that he was an influential leader in the early church and really used by God to bring stability to these brand new churches and lots of evangelism. He was able to lead many to faith in Christ. So Kitchen Table Theologian, we encourage you Take your own deep dive into who Titus was. Pastor Jeff mentioned that resource, gotquestions.org. You can read through that article there and you might gain a deeper appreciation for one of the influential people who really helped establish the church during those earliest days. Thanks so much for listening to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast with Pastor Jeff Cranston. 
If you're enjoying the podcast, take just a quick second, leave a rating and review. We really do appreciate your help in getting the word out. You can check out today's episode notes and more at jeffcranston.com. As always, thanks are due to our friends at Low Country Community Church here in Bluffton, South Carolina, and at Streamline Podcasts for making this podcast possible. Next week, we will be continuing the Bible Overview series with one of the oldest Old Testament books, the Book of Job. Until then, always remember that the real power of theology is not only knowing it, but applying it. Thanks for joining us at the table. You've been listening to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast with Pastor Jeff Cranston. Join us next time for more insights into biblical truth. If you'd like to know more on today's topic, please check out our show notes. If you have a question from today's podcast, kindly email us at pastorjeff at lowcountrycc.org. If you're enjoying this podcast, would you consider leaving a rating and review? We deeply appreciate your help in getting the word out. And be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or in your favorite podcasting app to continue this journey with us as we learn about and apply God's word to our lives. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here at Kitchen Table Theology.